Um, okay, so end of the year, review of the year, good. Oh, am I recording? I'm recording. Right. Hello and welcome to Catholic. What, what are we? What are we on? <coughs> are we on 13? Is it? No, it's 12. Is it? Gavin? Oh, it's not 13 because we haven't, I, I don't know if it was. 12 or, 12 or 13. Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted 12 or 13. <laughs> <laughs> I can look it up for you. Oh, 12. Right. 12. Is 12. it? There we go. <clears throat> there we go. Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode 12. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. <laughs> well, we draw towards the end of a momentous year. And we thought since it's uh, the year that the Queen has died, that it might be a good chance to look back over the year and, and perhaps look at the... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what... Gavin, can you just introduce it? Yes, I can. <laughs> Thank you very much for trusting me with, with, with this particular job. Well, we're going to look at two things. We're going to, the royal family has been in the news, but it's got some theological and spiritual associations that are really quite powerful. Um, and one has to do with the uh, Harry and Meghan and William and Kate axis, um, because it's not just a family feud. We all have families, we all have family feuds, sadly, but it's, but it's one kind of moral code against another. And as it happens with Harry about to release his book, um, it's it's Harry and Meghan pretending virtue but practicing vice. So they're pretending love but they're practicing hate. They're pretending integrity but they're practicing revenge. And um, uh, almost apart from praying for them, we it needs to be it, it needs to be well. I say it, people know, know what it is. I say it doesn't need to be called out. But we need to remember that um, in this particular case, that the William and Kate are living out duty and forgiveness and turning the other cheek. And it's very powerful. We might go on from there to look at what happens with the Queen gone and the new King has come. And the fact that we're what a watershed, there's a new a new constitutional order. And there are two problems we might talk about. One is the, the dreadful anti-Catholic oaths that the, the Charles has to swear, though he tells us he doesn't mean them. So what's it, what does it do to a monarchy when you when you promise oaths you don't you tell people you don't mean he doesn't mean them because he wants to be a defender of faiths so he's made that clear he's continuing with that uh, and so these oaths are a uh they're a a, a shimmer they're a pretend i mean it's also quite ludicrous he's to, 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 to swear to uphold presbyterianism north of the border and anglicanism and episcopacy south of the border it's a very weird thing for a monarchy to do and it's all about pragmatism and not about integrity so can you survive if you don't practice integrity? Um, and then to look at the whether or not as the Church of England garnishes the, 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 the sort of the icing on the cake of, of, the, of the coronation, but actually is hemorrhaging on the ground and, and has no, it has no ethical or theological coherence. Anyone can believe what they want. And when it comes to workery, they're going with the crowd, leaving the leaving a space for the catholic church uh, so we might talk about what it would take for the catholic church to live up to its history and um, its foundations and its integrity in this country suddenly renew the possibility of being english and catholic again there's a synopsis of what i think we might want to talk about but you but catherine back to you mrs bennett you you have written an article that you're very you're very modest about which has yet to be published but is going to blow people away on, on Harry and Meghan. Uh, so you, well, why don't you tell us a, one, two of the observations you had up your sleeve? Well, I was asked to write about Harry and Meghan and I was a bit reluctant, partly because I haven't taken a huge interest in them and hadn't watched the documentary, but I then did. And well, as you mentioned, it's not, in a sense, it's what they represent rather than who they are as people. Because of course I don't know them, but um it's about saying, how do we cope if we identify as victims? And in a sense, we're all victims. And so the, the answer is to look at the perfect victim, Christ. And, and as you say, love turns the other cheek. Love makes self-sacrifice for the good of others. Whereas fear and hatred and anger um, cannot forgive and sacrifice others for self. So it was looking at that contrast through the lens of the story of Harry and Meghan 
and as you then mentioned Kate and William so um that's that's the kind of theme of the of the of the article and then saying in advent of course now is a good time to say what can we learn about a couple who seem to represent the spirit of the world um uh and the standard of the world rather than the standard of Christ and and how should we respond when we're faced with um, being hurt and, and pain as they clearly are. Tom, Tom Holland is about the only person I've heard for a long time to talk about the, the, the astonishment we ought to have about the victimhood of Christ being a, a, a motif for our whole civilization. Harry and Meghan would never use victimhood as a weapon if it wasn't for the fact that Christianity had implanted it uh, as, as a holy and a virtuous um, idea right at the heart of civilization because the victimhood of, of of Jesus is the inspiration for turning the other cheek, for carrying other people's sins, for for redeeming suffering with love. But what they've done is to, and, and what the whole left is doing, is to take this very blessed and beautiful vulnerability that the Romans and the Greeks and 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 the Goths and the Visigoths. Oh, well, they became Aryans, didn't they? But but Attila the Hun is only, all all dealt in power, you know, as as did Nietzsche. So most of the world civilizations are dealt in power and would have scorned any any society that suggested that victimhood was virtuous. But it's only Christianity that's done that, and then they've taken this very very beautiful and transformative uh, symbolism, and they've used it as an, as, a, as a weapon to hit other people with. And mm. the problem is they're not victims. They're not victims in any sense at all. They're, 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 they're very well resourced people who've decided that they weren't exercising enough power. And in order to mask the fact it was a power grab, they pretended to be victims. It's grabbing virtue and hiding, hiding the real moral issue. And I think one of the things I found most difficult this last year is the way in which the left have used, um, have used the notion of hate speech, particularly, to mask, uh, to mask what's really going on. So, in other words, anyone criticizing them, it's hate speech. But if they do it, it isn't. Uh, so it's this whole business of of pretending, where where dissembling about where moral virtue and vice lie. Mm. Actually, I think it's very close to the unforgivable sin. I think what Jesus meant by the unforgivable sin was was deliberately misnomering evil and good. If you if you say if you if you claim evil as your good there is no repentance you can't repent from that because there's, there's, there's nothing to repent of and therefore you can't be forgiven so i think actually that what's going on in the way in which virtue and vice are being deliberately disguised is very close to the unforgivable sin in terms of our metaphysical discernment yeah thank you i think it's uh what's interesting about it is how close it is to virtue oh. you know that 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 sort of um, approach is or is it's not like a completely different new approach it's taking what we recognize as virtuous and twisting it a little bit and mm. um, you know and that to me is the smell of sulfur about the whole about any of these things you know and you see it um when you're talking about like the woke progressive agenda that you know when they say things like love is love and you know mm. they're what they're doing is they're they're saying things that sound like they, you know, they sound like truth or there's an element of truth to it. Um, and that it's just like the truth, but twisted a little bit, isn't it? To, mm. And and the trouble is that people have found it difficult to articulate a, a proper intellectual response. Uh, with, and it's not difficult to do. And yet it, it hasn't been done. And that, that sort of sums up my concerns about the whole, about the way we're seeing things change with the monarchy um, and the the lady hussy thing was a big part of that as well the the response to that i think has been a kind of a watershed moment for a lot of royalists who have seen who feel that you know that the, the palace has thrown um lady hussy to the wolves mm -hmm. in an in a pursuit of uh, appeasing those wolves you know with like with this sort of woke agenda now, uh, you see that a lot in society at the moment mm. don't you i think you know in terms of what we see over the course of the year we've seen um and instead of standing up for what's valuable and what they should be standing up for you know like and um to conserve the traditions and the structures that are, are, that form our society instead of doing that 
they're sort of trying to appease the people who are pushing against those structures. And where do we see that going? It only ever goes, there's only one trajectory, isn't it? And it's always, it never works, basically. And you see that in the Church of England, that they're desperately trying to appease. And in the Catholic Church, unfortunately, you know, the, the various uh, Catholic school stories that we've been following. Mm. Um, you know, you, you've got a desperate attempt to sort of say, well, no, we're not, we don't really, we don't disagree with what you're saying. You know, we love you and we want you to be. But instead of saying, no, that's wrong, it's harmful and it's dangerous for society. And I think it's that lack of courage in all these that binds all these things together that make it really problematic for us as a society as we move forward. And isn't that because all of these structures have lost power a little bit, Gavin, do you think? Well, they've, they've, they've lost integrity and without integrity, uh, we will collapse. I think what I found very difficult about the palace is that we know not to apologise to the left. Uh, it never does any good at all. They just demand more blood. More, more, more. <laughs> more. And so there should be someone in the palace who, who, as they sat down, said, what do we do now? Do we sacrifice Lady Hussey, uh, who's, who's done, you know, she's a sweet old biddy who's, who's done nothing but but serve the state and the and the royal mm. family and the, the body politic. It's a dreadful thing to do. Or, and do we apologise to these people? There's a great deal to be, uh, I'm not sure if I, we said it on, on Unscripted, but but I've, I've known a number of upper middle class women, uh, uh, grannies, and what they do is they, they, they fiddle with your, your buttons. It's a way of, they sort of reach out and touch you and pour you. It's, 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 it's a sort of way of making contact and saying, uh, you know, you're one of us and, and I'm feeling very grannyish about you. And let, let me just fix your hair or your lapel or or your button or or let me just pull this piece of spray away from you. I mean, that's that's what they do. It's a cultural thing. And I think what has really annoyed me is here is our culture. We're allowed to be proud of our culture. We're allowed to be proud of the royal family. We're allowed to be proud of nice grannies who welcome people. And why should it be that 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 people who've come to our culture recently, second, third generation immigrants, doesn't matter what generation they are, should refuse to acknowledge that there's a cultural lesson to be learned about us and to accommodate, meet us halfway in the same way as we must meet them halfway because we're generous hosts. They ought to meet us halfway too. But there's no sense that the palace value their own system by throwing Lady Hussey to, to the baying walls. So it was wrong to apologise, wrong to give way, wrong to allow a piece of something that was clearly not racism. Did any of you see that lovely picture of her str strutting on the arm of a wonderful black uh, officer, guards officer? Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, I, I was very proud of that. You could not be less racist than having a lady in waiting, uh, uh, so enjoying the company of a, of a young, vivacious black guards officer. The idea that she's racist, or, you know, that she's got 81 and her racism has never been explicit before somehow. You know, it, it's just so wrong and so ludicrous. And once again, it's this business of taking something that is perfectly good and pretending it's bad. This mm. inability to distinguish between good and evil. And if we can't do that, we're we're really in trouble. And the problem is these are our these are our core institutions which define who we are. And if, if, if the royal family and the whole notion of royalty and monarchy feel that they have a legitimate place in our society, they have to stand up for themselves mm. or they delegitimize themselves. Mm. Yeah, this um, this is why when I wrote about Lady Hussey, I mentioned critical race theory. And there are some people who say, oh, not everything's critical race theory. But I think it matters because that is what is at the root of a lot of this and, and quite a few of the articles I've written recently whether it's the fashion house scandal or the Lady Hussey affair is exactly as Mark said it's 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 sort of aping aping what is good and what is uh beautiful and but it and it's close to it but it but it's manipulative and twisted and it's not true um but it but because it's close I think it it can sort of entrap Christians uh, and they're sort of brought and swept up in it and um i've had everyone few, wants to be I, kind everyone wants everyone to be wants kind to be. and everyone wants to be nice yeah. and i've had a few people saying oh i understand what you were saying but poor lady uh, uh, um the poor woman she hurt her feelings i said I, I don't doubt that her feelings were hurt nobody's saying that her feelings weren't hurt but the, the thing is i am I, i'm saying i'm saying her feelings weren't hurt i well, think the we don't know they may they, <laughs> they may have been hurt i don't maybe her feelings were hurt. I, i'm in a sense it it 
it's it's not a, it's not a national news story if her feelings were hurt because I think my feelings were hurt at some point yesterday, uh, and and we all we all feel that way. But it's a confusion. It's it's the it's a confusion of good and evil. And I think one you know in, when St Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit and he he lists them in various order, one of the most important ones is discernment. And that's just it's one that I prayed for from the moment I became a Christian because it seems to me if you can't tell the difference between what is good and what is evil then you can't really speak on behalf of the lord or the gospel you can't bring the gospel to bear with its searchlight of, of what it is uh, on society you need to match up what's mm. good in society with what's good in the kingdom and and be able to say what is rotten in society and also to see the perversions in the church as well mm. it's absolutely essential we should do this but um it's not just postmodernism which has made this impossible but it's as if our society doesn't care about it i mean we've even got to the point now where same minor attraction uh, minor the sexual people, attraction yeah. people uh um what we always knew as pedophilia one of the grossest sins of of all time they're they're trying to push to make it sound yeah. as though it's good i yeah. mean this was it was i remember saying five years ago this was going to be the next stage of the cultural of the progressive bandwagon and people said "Ooh, you're sick how could you even think mm. that yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and 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 here it is in mainstream it's yeah. really terrible and the church is not calling it out and that's really terrible um, and that's the danger of 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 this masquerading as good because you then try and make it you make it untouchable you you sneak in what is not good and what is not true but you mask it with this niceness and and goodness so that it's so that you make it exempt from criticism and there's stuff there that needs to be criticized it's not nice to call a paedophile a minor attracted person so as not to hurt their feelings it's right to uh, matt frad's talked about this to, to to name things to name things that we should be ashamed of to name things that are wrong and speak plainly and if we're so desperate to to try and tiptoe around and not hurt anyone's feelings what happens is we no longer understand that some things are just wrong. Some things are bad. Evil exists, and we have to be able to name it. So it's that masquerading is really the problem. Well, this uh, might be our bridge into. Sorry, Mark. Well, I was just going to say, do you not think that um, the fact that the structures don't recognise this problem that is how the evil, how the rot is really setting into the foundation? So you could say, when you look at uh, Her Majesty's funeral, you can see that that there is a need and a desire in society the way that it was supported gives us a window into the fact that these are things that we do value we do value our culture as as british people you know as members as members of the united kingdom citizens or what are we we're uh, subjects <laughs> there we go i've got there <laughs> um, so you know i think that the the massive outpouring of genuine affection and and grief that we saw shows that these are important things and yet when the structures themselves fail to stand up and speak the truth in the face of these evils. Instead, they capitulate to them, even if it's only incrementally. That is a sign that things are, that there's some serious rot setting in there. And you could say that, you could easily see that repeated in the Church of England and in the Catholic Church as well, where there's this constant capitulation to these like nice ideas or whatever, instead of a rigorous you know, instead of us standing up and, and giving a defence and a counterpoint and saying, no, that's dangerous and wrong. And I, th I think it's really symptomatic of a deeper, of a, of a direction that we're heading in that's going to be, cause us massive problems if we don't deal with it. There's, I'm sure that's true. And two of the things that really struck me in the last 48 hours were, see, were, were had to do with schools, which will take us back to Catherine's area of expertise. Um, and so there was an evangelical Christian talking on GB News about the way in which he'd pulled his children out of a, a Church of England school because his eight-year-old was being read trans propaganda where all the children were being told that doctors only guessed at the sex of a child when it was born. Mm. And it was for the children to decide whether they'd been born in the wrong body or not. And he said, I, I sent my child to the Church of England school because I, I thought, I believed, I trusted, I hoped that they were going yeah. to get some ethical teaching but actually they're at the forefront of teaching what is in fact a madness it's a it's a you know, gender dysphoria is a mental illness which has now become legit it's an anti-scientific mental illness which has become 
being legitimized by teachers and taught in church schools. Mm-hmm. If so, we can't call that out, something that yeah, obviously yeah. problematic, then we're what? What is the point of it? They might, yes. you know, the people might as well give up. Who are doing even, even Dr. Robert Winston, uh, some months ago, maybe last year, was on Question Time. He's and he was sort of and tried to it. quiet him down. Don't say that. You can't say that. And you think this is this is a doctor who knows of what he speaks, and you're trying to silence him because we're not. So the thing about the truth is, it's we've forgotten that everything must be relative to Christ. That's the center. So that's the our ju- that's how we judge, isn't it? It's not. We don't fit christ in around something else around crt around feminism around gender ideology and where can we fit our faith in it's everything must fit around christ and that's the only that's why there's everything so confused it's because we've lost that and you see the need for religion you know in the woke agenda you know you see the way that um people are, are you know they've adopted it in in a religious fashion and they're uncritical in their acceptance and the way that they are evangelizing, mm. you know, they, and they can't even explain yeah. the reasons for it. What really, what, and that's, I mean, I think that like Chesterton said, you know, it's not that people won't believe in anything, yeah. it's, or it's well, not that they won't believe in nothing, they'll believe in anything. And I think we, you know, that sort of is what we're seeing, that God's need, uh, man's need for God. And because um, we've withdrawn from, um, the truth from the Christian truth, then that be sort of an acceptance of any old rubbish that comes along, be it BLM or it's a, a way of attaching yourself to an ideology, you know, uh, that allows you to express that rectitude or religious seal or adherence to a doctrine that makes you think that you're somehow superior. Perhaps I don't know. It's a, it's a dangerous. You know, it's like the, I said to one of my boys today. It's like the worst kind of religion isn't it you know it's like a a kind of zealousness that doesn't listen to any any other point of view or consider anyone else's feelings they just seem to shout obscenities at you i think what we one of the things we have to do is to name this new religion if you think for a moment that this business in the church of england school uh, joins together the bible and and science uh the science says there are two there are two you know, biology teaches our two sexes the bible teaches that god made humanity right. as man and woman and, and this other religion is is beating them both and what is this other religion it's a mixture of victimhood and niceness and so one of the reasons why the trans thing has got so much energy behind it is because they're the latest victims i w- i was born into my body in the wrong way i can't help it i'm a victim and we have to be nice to victims all the time and so this this astonishing combination of victimhood niceness has managed to undermine both christianity and even science which is which gives an idea really i think of how how incredibly powerful it is. The other thing I saw in the week was something called School of Rock. I remember seeing a film a long time ago, the, oh. the original film, and that's become a musical. And in Australia, a Catholic diocese put it on as one of its entertainment. It was a huge thing. It was put in a, an auditorium uh, with thousands of actors and actresses, and some parents complained. Um, but again, it was the Catholic Education Service, Giza, who pushed it and ran it. So it happened, and at the end of it, they they said to the bishops, uh, and to the education service we're profoundly unhappy with the symbolism uh, the anarchic symbolism the promotion of gay relationships as being the touchstone of, of amorous truthfulness and beauty we're profoundly uh, uncomfortable with this as catholics we want an apology that you've harnessed all the resources of the catholic education system to promote this piece of artistry which fundamentally undermines everything we believe in and so first of all the bishops wouldn't apologize and 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 the, the 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 apology that the head of the education service gave, or the man in charge of it, was perfunctory and cosmetic at the best, and and, and there we are, we're stuck again. I mean, that's how far the rot has gone. We have to invite the Catholic laity to stand up and make a great deal of fuss. You know, bless the evangelical laity in Kent for standing up and saying we want Church of England schools to be places where Christian virtues are challenged. I mean, and if if only. Well, if only the the people, if only parents and people would actually act out our beliefs, we could have some traction before it got too far. But because people aren't, I think, they, I think it, the time is coming, and I think it's I think it's all about efficacy. 
like um, apathy rules among Catholics, you know, in education, as far as my experience goes. And I think the large portion of that, of the way that that attitude is developed is because people don't see what the point of it is anymore. And if they, if this is facilitated to the point where it really starts to take over and grabs hold, they're going to figure out pretty quickly what the point of it is, what the efficacy of it is. And that I'd love to dig down into that a little bit more with you guys, you know, like, how have we ended up here? It's like a mixture of relativism, isn't it? It's this idea that you're, you, you know, you've spoken about it before, Catherine, that you're unique, everyone is special, all that matters is your feelings. It's like this, you don't belong to a community. It's all about the only thing that matters is how everything affects you as an individual. Yeah, man is the measure of all things. I, I, I mean, I think that the the instinct for religion as in for relationship with our creator is is there it's in our nature it's the sort of creature we are uh, and it's inevitable so religion if you look at it in that way is a relationship that you can anchor yourself to in some way is inevitable now if you don't find that in a relationship with your creator to whom you will return for you know this is why you why you exist then you'll find it elsewhere and but, but wherever you find it it does the point is it's answering a deep need in all of us and so we saw that after George Floyd where there was candles and pictures and kneeling and so the that instinct comes out somehow and it's coming out it's misdirected so our task I think is to help redirect people to say the instinct isn't necessarily wrong but it's it's wrongly directed and there's nothing at the end of it and now, isn't that because we have we have stopped teaching the beauty and power yeah. and the unique nature of the Christian truth, and and instead these things are more perhaps more visceral, like an event like uh, the George Floyd thing, mm. and it, you, they people can connect it to their lives in a very real way. And somehow, I mean, it's a perfect time to be talking about this stuff at Advent, isn't it? Yeah. Where you you know you you get like this perfect sort of uh, opportunity to really dive into the mystery. Of the incarnation and recognize the power going you know you're all like one of the themes of our discussions this year i'd say would be that um the, the idea of imminence and transcendence you know mm. uh and and this is the time when that imminence really takes hold doesn't it when the the transcendent god that li that exists beyond time and space becomes a specific example of humanity born in a stable in Bethlehem and enters into time and space in a real and definitive way. It's such a powerful idea. Was it uh, Irenaeus said that, mm. the, you know, the flesh is the hinge of uh, the incarnate of the faith. You know, that's everything yeah, relies on that, doesn't it? I'm so proud to be part of a programme where Irenaeus is quoted. One of the things I'd like to see is... Badly. Is, 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 <laughs> One of the things I'd like to, I'd like to see is is that the true spirit of Christmas celebrated because it's mm. always very interesting the way in which wokery, like a chess player, gets in front of you to kind of dig a hole for you to fall in. So the way wokery's done that is to talk about inclusiveness, but actually Jesus came to bring division, and uh, the division between well light and darkness, between good and evil, between people who wanted wanted to choose God and people who wanted to choose themselves, holiness and narcissism. The whole Christian episode is, is, a, is an exercise in distinction and division in order that all that is good, true, beauty and lovely can be separated ultimately from the tears, from, from the opposite. And, and all this has happened because of the gift of freedom. What the gift of freedom has done theologically is to make, make moral virtue very difficult to see because everybody claims moral virtue for their own actions no matter how corrupt they are there's that wonderful wonderful skit uh who, who's that pair the um they play a couple of nazis and they one of them says are we the bad ones <laughs> because <laughs> even the Na yes yeah. right. even the, even the nazis claimed to be good which which yeah which people forget so Jesus, the, the Christmas, it's about division. If only the division between, I mean, start with the division between light and darkness and then move on from there. We, we have to confront inclusivity as being a lie and, and a deliberate attempt mm. to muddle morals, which is what it, because, because they don't even mean it, because the first the people they exclude are the Christians or anybody yeah. who criticizes them. So, so not only is it, is it fallacious as an anti-Christian concept, but it's hypocritical and vacuous. 
but will we hear people talking about about how Jesus comes to bring proper division so we can see good from evil? I I doubt it. It'll be much more um the cuddly stuff and that's that's the problem with the with this pseudo religion the the nice victimhood it's about people taking moral labels and always choosing the easy way the comfortable way mm. the self-serving way instead of the self-denying way which is so difficult and what we're called to and what we need to be doing i think um is echoing what our lady told uh lucia at fatima isn't it you know it, like that the, this is where the battle is going to be in the family uh, you know yes. and you can see yes, how, yes. how it's coalescing around these issues and these are, are even if to take religion out of it for a second and and like we you know if we go back to the royal family thing or the the couple the british culture thing that we um you know if you talked about what actually it means to be britain british surely it is family you know it's these are the values aren't they and you can see them being eroded you can see you know fathers being taken out of the equation uh, broken families rule and again we mustn't say anything because we want to be nice all the time mm -hmm. and ultimately what, what's the result the result is that the basic building blocks of our society are being eroded and that will have an effect you know and so we should be standing up I, I feel especially at Advent and saying look make your choice you know Deuteronomy 30 like you know, Moses says then choose life or choose death and these are your choices and as this stuff progresses in our society i think that is becoming ever more clear don't you think mm -hmm. and it starts off as a gentle capitulation and it is a bit of a you know slippery slope argument but all those things relativism uh utilitarianism um you know i, I was uh, watching an interview with sam harris you know the mm -hmm. one of the new atheists one of your favorite new atheists <laughs> catherine <laughs> um and he and you know claims himself as it claims to be an ethicist uh, and he was arguing you know he was arguing from a utilitarian perspective but basically saying we don't have to be honest with the electorate it's fine to lie to people as long as we get our way you know it's sort of yeah. <laughs> extraordinary right, right, yeah. it's a swine ethic for sure yeah yeah unbelievable yeah yeah one of the things i hope we, we should pray for is ask our bishops to consider take be becoming more public about the virtues of the Catholic faith. Mm. Um, you don't hear anything from the Anglican bishops now. The par partly it's a managerial decision from Lambeth, but partly also they can't speak on behalf of Anglicanism because there is no coherent ethical position for, for, for the coalition of spiritualities that makes up the Anglican Church. But with the Catechism and the Magisterium, Catholicism brings to the party like no other organisation no other organism, no other philosophy, a clear, rigorous, historically tested ethical articulation to the problems. And it would be, you know, and, and of course we get into trouble when we do this. We get into trouble over abortion. They're passing laws against us now. We get into trouble over con contraception. We're being ridiculed for it. And yet and we get into trouble with, with celibacy. But actually, who would have known that the 20th century would have been brought a, a, a sexually addictive culture which again the catholic church is the only organization to 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 institutionalize a response to the to the addiction of sex by saying by insisting on celibacy uh, it took me it, one of the things that, that moved me very speedily towards being a catholic was when i i moved from being embarrassed about about celibacy thinking but buying into the whole freudian repression thing oh no it'll all go wrong to suddenly seeing that this was the only the only organization that was challenging the the addiction upon which our whole economy is being run sex sells everything so i think i'm very proud of the catholic church i'm sorry i've discovered it so late but i wish our bishops would be proud of it too i wish that they would take advantage of their public platforms and speak out into the public space and say to a very hungry and confused and demoralized mm. nation that's being completely bamboozled by a small percentage of activists this is the truth this is goodness this is light this is wholesome try this with us yeah. brilliant yeah. I, I, that's what the more time i spend with my um protestant brothers and sisters especially the baptists i'm having great you know really sort of fruitful conversations but it becomes increasingly clear to me that the catholic church is the bulwark bulwark you know it is the the place where the deposit of faith has been given to us and it it strikes me and i don't mean this in a pejorative way at all but that all the protestant denominations 
are capitulating. They're, they're embracing some form of moral relativism. You know, they've stepped away from Catholicism and they've made, there are incremental incursions into that moral, ball, you know, that bulwark. And that really, that really interests me. That, that's notwithstanding the fact that, you know, I learned so much from my Christian friends, you know, and it's not taking anything away from that. Thank God for them. And I think I learned more about my faith. But, um, but like, I think that's really interesting is it, my experience has been that it just makes Catholicism more beautiful. You know, the more I learn, the more I see, the more experience I have of, of Christianity. And exactly as you say, you know, that's my fight um, and has been for, you know, a long while now is that I wish that I don't see a problem. I, I think perfectly perhaps um, explained when we talked about last week, Archbishop Cordelioni walking that line between love and truth, uh, talk, uh, in, you know, in San Francisco. And you, you juxtapose that with the, the message that came out of our bishops ad limina, which was just, you would, honestly, you know, you'd think that if that's the best that Jesus has got to proclaim his good news to the world, you know, you think they'd ne they'd never read anything about him. You think he never did anything interesting from what they've got to say, and that is a terrible sin. I think you know that it's like that. Well, you've you've both jumped ahead before I had a chance to ask you because I thought it would be lovely to end the year um, by asking you what are the joys of being a Catholic for you. We've talked generally about the importance of Catholicism, the beauty of it, but on a personal level, we spend quite some time being rightly critical of some of the things we find in our culture um, but to end the year perhaps we could speak personally to how being a Catholic has changed our lives has enriched our lives has made our lives more beautiful and true and what why it's something that we should share with others Mark um, well I think you two are a perfect example Catholic friends I'd say you know when you're a Catholic you've got friends everywhere in the world it's absolutely brilliant and you can go and you'll you know you'll find really close relationships very very quickly it doesn't matter where you go in the world just because you've got that shared commitment to Christ through the through the Catholic faith and my experience has been you know for everywhere you go wherever you go in the world you're welcomed as part of a you feel part of a global community and though and those friendships are really important and really deep ones so that is absolutely fantastic. Um, and the other thing I'd say is the intellectual integrity that, uh, you know, is one of the things that I really think we, we, you know, we do sort of try and highlight a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you're, I think you're brilliant at Catherine. And obviously Gavin brings his fantastic intellect to bear on it. And so hopefully everyone sees that there is um, that dialogue going on between us. And that's what I really enjoy is the mm -hmm. intellectual rigour and the fact that, um, the faith, you know, it's like there's this sort of habit of um, apologising for what we believe. But it's through studying the faith, you can really come to see how beautiful it is and how it affects and changes your life and other people's lives. And that's only ever for the better. If there's any negative things associated with the Catholic Church, then they are where, pe where there's a lot, you know, a wedge driven between... The, the intellectual truth, um, the, you know, the faith, um, the, it's the fides qua, isn't it? You know, the, like the faith that's believed by the people. Um, and that, and so, I, you know, I think that, that we need to talk about that more. And I wish that that was explained a little bit more to, to lay people. So perhaps that will be our mission as we go forward a little bit. Gavin. Well, I, I've been becoming a Catholic for a long time. Um, uh, and one of the frustrations of trying to become a Catholic as an Anglican, because there's a fiction that you can be, uh, was the experience, the, the, the horrible experience of pluralism in Anglicanism. And I'm not putting Anglicanism down. It was a, Anglicanism was a very interesting ecumenical experiment that produced some very beautiful things that might have worked, but it didn't. Um, but one of the real frustrations was this, this in, insubstantial pluralism everywhere. So, for example, if you, if you loved Our Lady, you, you had to be careful because there'd be some people in the congregation who would have Puritan reflexes of, you know, you can't, you know, of Mariolatry. They, if you loved, if you believed in the mass, 
uh, you'd have some people taking the Eucharist as if it was just a piece of bread. One of the things I found most interesting as an Anglican priest was the different fate with the faces of people as they received the sacrament. And I, I got terribly upset and worried when I saw on some people that they had no idea what they were receiving. And they were treating it as though it was th th this most precious and most wonderful, wonderful event as if it was... So that was an example of the pluralism. The, the fact that when it came to ethics, again, there was this, no one agreed on anything. And there was, it was a kind of incoherence, almost an, an, an anarchy, which was very upsetting. And becoming a Catholic, well, it's just amazing to sing the Hail Mary at the end of a mass, to turn around and acknowledge Our Lady uh, in, in the physical representation someone's put up there, to, to know that the mass is the mass is the mass is the mass and the miracle, this incredible miracle of transformation takes place every single time. Um, to, to have the catechism, to have the ethics, suddenly the ground is solid under my feet and I just take a huge, huge breath of, of gratitude at uh, being home and being safe and being in a real church instead of an experimental um, wandering group of people who, however well-meaning they are, have no internal coherence at all. And therefore, without any internal coherence, all they can really, I mean, it's very important that everyone should say you need to be saved by the love of Jesus. That is the bedrock. But the problem is the moment you go beyond that, if you can't continue any form of coherence, you can't have you can't welcome people into the church. <clears throat> so for me, it's this movement from from uh, insubstantial relativism into the into the, the substantial dependability of the faith that has been the same faith at all times and in all places since Jesus founded his church and gave it to the apostles who gave it to the the sub apostolic era and it, you know and okay. so on and so on so i'm i'm still i'm still fizzing away with light and joy at the privilege of having become a catholic and i'd like to share it with as many people as possible that's beautiful um for me i think there's there's a real peace in just placing yourself under the mantle of Christ and his church, Our Lady. And I, I know that reading that is very unpopular today, wives submit to your husbands and husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. But there's, you know, the, the children, children want to be in a home with both their parents. This is the natural state and it's best. And we have that deep desire to be connected and to be under protection. And to be a Catholic is to be, is to know that you are, um, that you have placed yourself into the body of Christ, that you receive uh, communion, that you are, that you have, as Mark said, you're connected throughout the world with fellow Catholics who make up this body, but all under the head of Christ. Um, and you cannot, you know, th there is peace and safety. And most of all, it's coherent. Everything falls into place. Everything makes sense. I feel like before I was a Catholic, before I at least not was a Catholic because I was baptized a Catholic, but before I uh, returned to my faith and came to understand it, I felt that um, I was angry. And we see this a lot in the world. I was so angry and I would turn here and I would turn there. And a little bit of this made sense and a little bit of that made sense. But it's only since I've come into the church that I can sort of breathe out. I can exhale. I can relax my shoulders and trust and know because I see it and I feel it and I experience it that this is true and good and beautiful and to place yourself under that um, mission to place yourself under Christ and say protect me thank you for your love continue to look after me and my family is just beautiful and through the sacraments this is a daily thing you can't you know I went to confession just the other day before Christmas and to walk out of those doors and just know that your sins are forgiven you know it you don't you're not left wondering I spoke to an ex-Calvinist recently and he said for all the talk of Calvinism you're either in or you're out you spend your whole life saying I'm not sure but you, you walk out and you just you just know you have that promise from the highest authority and you begin again and you get up and there's it's just so beautiful and there is a peace there that that I that won't be found anywhere else. Happy Advent. <laughs> happy Advent. Happy, happy, happy Feast Advent. of Nativity. Happy Christmas. Yeah. Well, so as we draw to the end of 2022, we've got 
some developments for 2023, which we hope to share with you as the new year begins. But expect to, the mug. <laughs> expect to see <laughs> expect to see more of these. Um, but we will we will be back uh, in a week or so. We're not quite sure yet, but we'll talk to you about some of those. And we thank you very much for sticking with us, for supporting us, for watching, for sharing, and ask that you continue to do so as we begin a new year. And most of all, we ask your prayers and uh, be assured that we pray for all of you before we begin each week. Can I make a quick plea? I always used to laugh at Kevin Kelson on Anglican Unscripted when he began everyone with please like and share. And they were very concerned for their for their numbers. Actually, one of the things I'm grateful for are the people who leave comments. We read them all. Uh, it takes a while to get to them sometimes. But if if you could think about who whom this could be shared with amongst your friends, um, because if this this might. This, this clearly works evangelistically to some extent, and some people are very grateful for it. So as well as watching it, think if there's anyone you could send it to that you think, as you prayed, might might respond well to it. And that would be a very good way of of spreading the influence of the, of the church and this particular charism that we share with you. And thank you. Is it mugs? <laughs> no, no, I just every opportunity. <laughs> that's it. That's it. So that's it for the end of uh, the end of this year. Thank you very much. Uh, for joining us and uh, we will be back as the new year begins and have a happy Christmas, a peaceful Christmas. I'm Catherine Bennett. Happy Christmas, I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Happy Christmas, happy new year. God bless you. Thank you. See you the other side, God willing.